We are Acts 238 Salvation Message Compliant. Are you? That the Acts 238 message uh, is the basic message of Christianity. If you don't believe that, I want to be nice to you, but I want you to tell me why you don't believe it. We don't have to explain to you why we believe it. You've got to explain to us why you don't believe it. Uh, because that's the man with the key. Holy Ghost Radio. Have you received the Holy Ghost since ye believe? And I'm not just trying to hype you up, but I want to tell you, this is one message that's not going down. It doesn't matter if it's pre-modern, modern, or post-modern. This message is hot. It's cutting edge. It's on the level. It's always going to be powerful. You can never outlive its power. Visit our website at www.holyghostradio.com. And if you want to be relevant, then preach Acts 238. Because that's the message that's relevant to every generation. I want to talk to you for a few minutes on the subject of biblical leadership. And uh, there are so many voices in the world today about leadership. Uh, I was talking to one of America's foremost theological leaders, most demanded teachers the other day, and um, we were talking about this, and he said, if you try to keep up with the literature that's being written on leadership today, you would you will become obsolete about every six months, uh, because everybody has found that it is a lucrative market, and so experts are proliferating. And uh, once they decide that the money is not in leadership, but it's in something else, there will be another market. But today it's, it's in this. And this is also true in the area of um, becoming more true in the area of Christian leadership, ministerial kind of leadership, whether it's preachers or, or the saints of God. Um, so I want to talk to you a little bit about biblical leadership, but I'm not going to tell you what I think biblical leadership is or is not here. I'm, I'm going to see if you can figure it out, all right? And um, it's not complex. It's really pretty simple. Uh, but we're, going, we're just going to see if the Bible can tell us what constitutes the core root of effective biblical leadership. How do we find this? So maybe we could find it if we actually took time to look in the Bible. Kind of a novel idea, but um, maybe we could find it if we actually went to the Word of God together. So let's let's play this little uh, Bible game this morning. Um, let's re- let's reduce this to the most infantile level, uh, so that we can all just relax and enjoy this together. So, if it's a if it's a game, then everybody has to be involved. So here's what we'll do: we will give you examples, all right, of biblical leadership, and then and then would you read the scripture out loud with me? And then at the end. We'll take a little test. Oh, I mean, we won't pass out pen and paper to take the little test, but we'll just take the little test and let you grade yourself. There will only be one question on the test, and I don't think anyone will fail, so don't get intimidated by the test. I think everybody will pass. The second thing is, is if you don't pass, nobody's going to know but you. When we give the right answer, just smile and say and nobody will know that you didn't have the right answer all of the time. Now, don't you wish every teacher was as accommodating this morning uh, as, as we are in this session? So I, I think that we'll all be able to figure this out. Some of you have a tremendous uh, lack of confidence in yourself academically, but you're going to be so reinforced today because you're going to pass this profound theological test, and you're going to feel so good about it. I'm guaranteeing you ahead of time that you're going to pass. 
because if you get it wrong, we will correct it in class. And then we will grade them and send them in to Jesus. All right? So, so let's, let's take this profound test together. And the question we're looking for is, what constitutes biblical leadership? That's the question. All right? So first, let's look at, um, well, did you enjoy last night's preaching, you that were here? What a masterful job Brother Todd Nichols did of kicking this conference off into the ionosphere. That's the third heaven. And uh, it was great. It was great. Uh, atmosphere is for 747s. Stratosphere is for these 50-mile high deals. But ionosphere is for... Uh, Nichols aircraft. And it was, it was great. It was great. You've got Boeing and then you've got McDonnell Douglas and you've got Nichols. And, uh, thank you, Brother Nichols, uh, for that last night. So, what constitutes biblical leadership? Example number one and hint number one. Moses. Numbers. 1117. Read it out loud with me, will you? I don't guess you can. There it is. All right. Now just follow along with me. And you that are real fast readers, please tolerate we who are a little more dyslexic and, and, and help us. We'll go slow enough that we can all get into this. We, okay? Even those that, yeah. All right. All right. Here we go. Numbers 11, 17. And I will come down and talk with thee there, and I will take of the Spirit which is upon thee, and will put it upon them, and they shall bear the burden of the people with thee, that thou bear it not thyself alone. All right, that's our first example and our first scripture in trying to determine what constitutes biblical leadership. All right, hint number two, personage number two, Joshua. That's our example. Scripture number two, Numbers 27, 18. Everybody there? All right, let's read. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take thee Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay thine hand upon him. Ah, ah, ah. Some of you are already saying you know the answer. Let's go through all the hints first so that everybody's on the same page before you give the answer. All right? The third example that we will use is a man named Othniel, who was a nephew of Caleb. We could talk about, you know, how this stuff gets connected with people who are around it, but we'll touch on that in just a minute. Othniel, in Judges 3 and 10, and it says this about him, And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he judged Israel, and went out to war. That's far enough. All right. Our fourth example. Our fourth example is Samson, Judges 634, which says, But the Spirit, is it up there? All right. Don't be hesitant, boys and girls. Just come on. Let's go. But the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, and he blew a trumpet. That's good enough. All right. All right. The hints are in the part we're reading, not in the parts we're not reading. Okay? Everybody with me? <laughs> the hints are in the parts we're reading, not in the parts we're not reading. Okay. Saul, 1 Samuel 10 and 1. Then Samuel, is it up there? All right. 1 Samuel 10 and 1, I think. Got it? All right. Let's go together. Then Samuel took a vial of oil and poured it upon his head and kissed him and said, Is it not because the Lord hath anointed thee to be captain over his inheritance? That's, that's Saul that that happened to. All right. Our next hint is David, the next king. 
and 1 Samuel 16 and 13, which says, Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. Now, some of you are not reading. Part of the grade is whether you participate in the class. All right. Then our next tent is in is the prophet Elijah in Second Kings chapter two verse sixteen, and they said unto him, Behold, now there be with thy servants fifty strong men. Let them go, we pray thee, and seek thy master, lest peradventure the spirit of the Lord hath taken him up. Now, that's good enough. All right. Then, for those of you who came in a little late, we are taking a test. Please sit down at your desk and get your pencil and paper and join us. You're not getting all the hints, but you've got enough here that you ought to be able to figure out what is biblical leadership, what is the core element of biblical leadership. Okay, we're on Elisha in 2 Kings 2 and 9, and... Uh, you know, just let me read this part to you because it's it's down in there somewhere. Is it on the screen? Okay. I pray thee, this is the last part of the verse, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. All right? That's, that's the hint about Elisha. And then we're not going to go through all of the major and minor prophets, but let's just take Ezekiel as our example here. And for the sake of time, I know that some of you are enjoying the participatory nature of this, but if you'll just let me read this, so I don't have to read the whole verse and not be offended, I'd appreciate it. Um, Ezekiel is our next example. In the book he wrote, chapter 2 and verse 2, he said, And the Spirit entered into me. Is it up there? Okay. Then that's also, we can find scriptures about Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, all of the minor prophets. Uh, also, that would indicate that they had the core biblical leadership. Then let's go to the New Testament with John the Baptist in Luke chapter 1 and verse 17, which says, if you'll just let me read it, he will also go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah. Talking about John the Baptist uh, going in the spirit and power of Elijah. And then our next example is Jesus himself when he comes off of the Mount of Temptation. In Luke 4, 18, the very first thing he says, according to the way Mark edits, uh, Luke edits the material, is when he comes back, he goes to Nazareth. He picks up the book in the book of Isaiah. And the first thing he says is, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach the gospel. All right? And then, well, let's stop there. Does anybody think so far they see a secret ingredient to biblical leadership? And what do you think it would be? I know some of you are still in a quandary, but some of you have figured it out. That the secret ingredient to biblical leadership is anointing of the Spirit. Is everybody, did everybody pass the test? All right. You feel good about that? This is the most intelligent class I've ever taught. I've never had a class that everybody got 100%. You are geniuses. This is awesome. I feel good about this. If the Baptists would have took this test, they probably wouldn't have all got it. But the Pentecostals, they all get it. All of you Baptists, I'm just kidding. We love you. All right. So, uh, the anointing of the Spirit is the key ingredient to biblical leadership. Now, something that Mr. Roger Stronstadt pointed out, and that is the important uh, several things. One is, is that this whole anointing idea starts in the Old Testament, but goes straight in the New Testament, and we read from Luke because Luke really picks this up 
and really emphasizes this, that in the Old Testament there was no biblical leadership. In fact, as far as the Bible is concerned, there is no leadership in the world that really matters except spirit-anointed leadership. There is none like spirit-anointed leadership. It is head and shoulders above any other kind of leadership that could be found in the world. And so it is a crying shame when we get tempted through our own carnality to use some other kind of leadership process or method or seemingly effective way to operate other than being committed to staying with our biblical model, which is to be anointed with the Spirit is the key. And all of the other sense of success is a byproduct, which is the outflow, the overflow, and the byproduct of Spirit-anointed leadership. And there's nobody that's got that theology as down as Pentecostals, apologies to everybody else. But there's nobody that understands that more than Pentecostals, and especially Pentecostals that insist that every believer receives the baptism of the Holy Ghost evidence with speaking in other tongues, because we understand the critical, foundational, essential nature of spirit anointing in God's faith community or in the church, in the body of Christ, can you say amen? Let's thank him for the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Amen. And so, this whole idea of spirit-anointed leadership from Moses on down, and there's many others that we could have named, this whole idea is that God has never had another pattern for leading his people. God does not have another pattern today for leading his people, and God is not going to develop another pattern for leading his people other than the one that he has already set up. There is no such thing as a leader in God's kingdom without anointing. Anointing is the key. And if the anointing is not there, then the whole leadership deal begins to crater quickly into all kinds of a whole miasma of confusion and we see some of that in our world today because there is not a revelation in the mind of everybody and in the heart of everybody of the critical foundational essential nature of spirit led leadership in the church nothing else will take you can't develop enough programs you can't develop enough uh, carnal infrastructure governmentally you can't you can't put together enough money in the bank you can't do there's no substitute for spirit led leadership none 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 and when and spirit led leadership produces its own fruit you don't have to worry about whether there'll be evidence that it's spirit led or not because it will produce its own fruit and its fruit will be good. Can you say amen? And so this is, this is the, this is the critical nature of this. Now, one of the little simple things we want to say that's a really important point though is that from Old Testament times up through Jesus, all of these we mentioned and many more, all of these <clears throat> were examples of the anointing being on the leader only, not upon the people that were being led. There was a distinction in terms of the people being led, but they did not have this particular spirit anointing upon them. Only the leaders, Moses, Joshua, Neil Samson, Elijah, Elisha, David, Saul, and Ezekiel, and on down, John Baptist, Jesus, they had the anointing, the, the, the anointing upon them as leaders, but the people did not have that same anointing. In fact, in Moses' day, there were two men that the anointing came on, and others in the camp came to Moses and said, These two men are over here prophesying. Hey, that's just reserved for you. And Moses prophetically himself spoke and said, Would to God that all of God's people have this prophetic anointing upon them. Amen. And so, so this is the significance. This is, if you don't get anything else that I say, please, I hope you, I pray you get this. That is that the beginning of the church is a revolutionary thing, which is the first time in the history of the world that the human race 
in which the prophetic anointing for leadership and empowerment and enablement came not only upon the leaders, but upon the entire corpus, the entire body, in which now every single member is anointed prophetically to be a leader in the kingdom of God. This is absolutely true and has all kinds of theological implications of how an apostolic church operates, of whether or not we help people to learn that so that they can teach home Bible studies, or whether we shut them down from teaching home Bible studies because we're afraid that they will accrue too much power and break off a little group and go berserk over here. The difference, the difference there is a theological difference in understanding the scripture of whether everybody is prophetically anointed or whether everybody is not prophetically anointed. And there is no question that the New Testament is emphatically underlining and reinforcing the idea in Acts 2, 1 through 4 that everybody is now receiving the Spirit. And this is what was so amazing to Joel in chapter 2 and so amazing to Isaiah in chapter 28 and so amazing to Jeremiah in chapter 30, 31. And again, repeated as the longest uh, Old Testament prophecy repeated in the New Testament. Hebrews 8 is from Jeremiah about the Holy Spirit being upon all of the people, written on the fleshy tables of their heart instead of on tables of stone, as they were with Moses. This is the, this is, this is, this is so, to the Old Testament prophets, it was like, this, how can this be? And then even to the New Testament apostles, it was shocking to them that this anointing was not only going to be upon the Jewish leaders of the, they believed in a worldwide revival. They believed that it was going to come through the Jewish nation just as it was prophesied in the Old Testament. They just didn't see the anointing coming upon Gentiles. But, but, but Joel's prophecy went beyond their kids. He said, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, but I'm going to pour my spirit upon all of it. And in Acts 14 and 15 and 15 and 14, they finally got the, they finally got the fact that during this time, God is calling out of the Gentiles, the people for his namesake. And their job, their job is that they all receive the Holy Ghost. And, and to all of you that don't believe that you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, evidence is speaking in tongues that that was only for the early church and only for the Jews. You go back and you look at what Peter said after in Acts 10, after Cornelius received the Holy Ghost, and he said, those that have received the Holy Ghost as well as we, and he goes on to say, and the longer you look at the Greek, the deeper it gets, that they received the exact same Holy Ghost in the exact same way as we did when it was given to us on the day of Pentecost. Amen. So don't give me this stuff about Gentiles not receiving the Holy Ghost. For number one, I've got it. Amen. I don't deserve it, but I do have it. How about you? No, let's clap our hands and praise Him for the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah! Amen. And so, the other thing about this, that, that, that we don't want to get too bogged down in this, but is that, is that there's, a, there's a continuity of how God has always had leadership. It's unchanging. And um, in academic language, it's programmatic. But it, there, there's, this, there's this, this transfer. It goes from Moses to the 70, and Moses to Joshua. And then it goes Othniel and Gideon and Samson and others. And then Saul gets it, and then David gets it the same way Saul got it. It leaves Saul. It goes to David. And somebody says, what about Solomon? Well, with Solomon, I don't have time to draw this out, but it is an important and interesting observation, that with Solomon, people begin to think of leadership as being something that is the genetic right of the children of those who led in the previous generation. And they begin to depend upon that. So you who do not have parents that were raised in Pentecost or you're not some kind of blue blood Pentecost, just smile when people try to pull that condescending deal over you. Just smile because it's your daddy that gives you the anointing. You're born from above. It's none of this flesh business that means absolutely nothing. And those that rely on that are doomed. They're doomed to failure, disappointment, and disenchantment. And so, in Solomon, by then they start depending upon fleshly generation. And so the Spirit doesn't do that. The Spirit moves to, to the prophets, and to Elijah, and to Elisha, 
And there's this, there's this, we've seen this transfer, and now we really see it in the Elijah, Elisha example, where, where Elisha says, I'm not just looking for anointing. I want a double portion of the anointing that's on you. And, and there, there's Hebraically, the, the Hebrews understood this. The Eastern mind understands this different than the Western mind. In the Western mind, we don't quite get this. It's hard for us to leave anything without boxing it all up and with tidily packaging it and tying the rope around it. But, and so we have a little problem with the transfer of the spirit along with a man's spirit, Elijah. But Elisha has no problem with that. He, he sees this. And this is what happened with the intertestamental writers that we say uh, they used to be called pseudo-pographical writings. In other words, these people pseudo, these people falsely used other people's names. But the people of that, they didn't look at it that way at all. They looked at it like whoever wrote that had the spirit of Enoch on them, or they had the spirit of whoever's name they had. That, that when they wrote that, it was holy, even though it was not part of the anointed canon. And, and so, in that same vein, here is Elijah, Elisha, picking up the spirit of Elijah, and then... And then John the Baptist, we read it, the scripture we read about John the Baptist, we intentionally picked that one because it said that the spirit of Elijah is on this man. And when people said, who is it? They said, Elijah has come. And even Jesus said of John the Baptist, Elijah has come. And then when they said, who is Jesus? They said, well, we think maybe it's Elijah. And then, and then during the tribulation, the Bible talks about Elijah being there. And the very last verse of the Old Testament talks about there's going to come a day when Elijah will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers. And Elijah becomes more than a type in the Old Testament. He becomes a representative man, which is above a type, just as Jezebel becomes a representative of the world. Ironically, both of them living contemporarily with each other and hitting head on the powers of the world and the powers of the prophetic community, the powers of military prowess, the powers of governmental structure, the power of politics, the power of Hollywood, the power of seduction and lust, all wrapped into one in Jezebel and in the New Testament. I mean, in, and then in Elijah, the prophetic community and the power of anointing. He has no army. He has no political power. He has no no Hollywood appeal. He has no appeal to the lust of the flesh. He has none of that stuff. And yet he stands there with a power that is transferred from generation to generation until it is the spirit of Elijah in the New Testament church that is used when he says, you've allowed Jezebel into the church. Get Jezebel out of the church. And the only way you get her out is the spirit of Elijah. The anointing of the Holy Ghost. You take that out and you've got legalism. You leave that in and you've got deliverance. Oh, let's clap our hands and praise Him. Hallelujah. Amen. And so this, this whole transfer deal is holy. And, and so now, in the New Testament, finally, if we just get a hold of this, the, the whole community is holy. Now, we use the term, and I've used the term this morning, and it is a correct term. We say the church is a prophetic community. By prophetic, I don't just mean that the Holy Ghost comes on them and they foretell the future. The word prophetic has a broader, that's part of the meaning, within, but it has a broader meaning. And what it means is, is it's a community out of the future. It is a community out of the future. That has come back into the present. And it is the only such community on earth. There is no other community out of the future. There are communities that extrapolate themselves out of the past. And they are very proud of their heritage and proud of their founding fathers and proud. And there is a past to the church too. But it is a future. It is a community. The Bible says we have tasted of the good world to come. Think of that. We have tasted of the cosmos. We have tasted of the infrastructure. We have tasted of the... We are living in the world to come, but we're living it in the present. That's what the prophetic community is. It means it's an advanced community out of tomorrow that is operating in today. Anybody that backslides out of the church has got to be ignorant because this is the most incredible, profound, 
profound, unbelievable thing that has ever existed. And it's an honor that none of us deserve to be a part of the kingdom of God. Oh, let's praise Him again. Holy Ghost Radio. We are Acts 238 Salvation Message Compliant. Are you? That the Acts 238 message uh, is the basic message of Christianity. If you don't believe that, I want to be nice to you, but I want you to tell me why you don't believe it. We don't have to explain to you why we believe it. You've got to explain to us why you don't believe it. Uh, because that's the man with the key. Holy Ghost Radio. Have you received the Holy Ghost since ye believe? And I'm not just trying to hype you up, but I want to tell you, this is one message that's not going down. It doesn't matter if it's pre-modern, modern, or post-modern. This message is hot. It's cutting edge. It's on the level. It's always going to be powerful. You can never outlive its power. Visit our website at www.holyghostradio.com. And if you want to be relevant, then preach Acts 238. Because that's the message that's relevant to every generation. And so this prophetic community means that like, like those Old Testament leaders were, they were empowered with the Holy Ghost. But now we become the temple of the Holy Spirit. The, this community is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And, and temples could be used for a lot of things, but they weren't. They were used only for the sacred. And all the utensils of that temple, they could have been used for slopping the hogs, but they weren't. And any utensils used for slopping hogs wasn't used in the temple. All the stuff in the temple was kept because it was holy unto the Lord. And holy H-O-L-Y and holy W-H-O-L-L-Y both come from the same root. They only made the distinction for religious purposes, but they're both from the same, they're both the same word. H-O-L-Y means W-H-O-L-L-Y. As well as other, other means. But, that meant if you had a dish, it didn't mean that it, that everything, there were a lot of things that dish couldn't be used for. It didn't mean that everything else that it could be used for was immoral. It's just that immorality was not the issue here. That, that I mean, it could be, but it's not always. It, it just meant that if you have a dish that's to be used for the temple, you don't use it at the supper table for John Brown's family over here. Not because John Brown's family is immoral, but just because this stuff is set apart only, only for this use. That's, that's all it does is this use. So when we become the temple of God, this is the whole basis for our rejection of artificiality and artificial ornamentation. This is the whole basis of why we don't paint our face. This is, when the Bible talks about defiling the flesh, it, defiling the flesh is a Jude term. It actually means painting. They, these, they taught them to paint the face. Now, you that are going to hear this, that are not part of the prophetic community. We don't care if you paint your face. We love you just like you are. We don't care. If, we don't care if you put a bag over your head. We're not trying to. We're not trying to superimpose this upon you. If if we were president of the United States, which isn't going to happen, but you know it's a hypothetical thing. If we were president of the United States, we wouldn't try to tell everybody you can't wear makeup. We're not trying to superimpose this upon you. No, no, you don't. You don't qualify for this. This is only for the prophetic community. If you're not part of the prophetic community, choose your color. We love you just like you are. No problem with us. We're just talking about the holy temple. We're not even saying that all of that has morality or immorality. We're just saying because we're the temple, we don't do that. Because we're set apart for one reason, and that is to be the holy temple of God. And that is because we have the Spirit within us. We are the prophetic community. We are separated unto Him. 
No graffiti allowed. Maybe see it. So don't be tagging yourself. And it's the same with all that stuff. Uh, ornamentation. Jewelry. Jewelry's jewelry. Doesn't matter where you put that ring with it's on your ear or in your nose. Or on your finger or on your foot or on your ankle or on your neck. Jewelry's jewelry. I'm not apologizing for that. But if you're not a part of the prophetic community, we want you to put five on each. I was at the car wash the other day, and my, my good friend's wife that runs the place was there. I tried to tell him she had at least seven or eight earrings in each year. She had a ring on every hand and two, on every finger and two or three on some of her fingers. And, and I don't care. I love them. That's, that's fine. No problem. But, you know, if you're part of the prophetic community, then you, you're not your own. You're bought with a price. And he says, no, no, this is the temple. You put all the glory inside, and you don't even paint the outside. It's the glow from inside that's going to create the beauty. And anything you use artificial only distracts from a beauty that's greater than fleshly beauty. Everything. All of this New Testament stuff all ties back to the fact that it's a prophetic community. It's an anointed community. That's the, that is the precise reason why we cannot all jump in the gender blender. It is because, it is because to project the image of God requires to get the whole image of what God is in his steel and velvet. It requires all of the image of God, man singular, which was made male and female. Man is made male and female. And so men and women are both required to give a balanced view. This is, this is the, this is why it is forbidden for men to be acting like or doing woman-like things and, and women to be acting like or dressing or wearing the apparel of men. Now I know that there are people who will pick this up off the internet and they will go into a raging frenzy of fury. Well, just don't hurt yourself, that's all I can tell you. <laughs> the whole idea of women not cutting their hair is because he said if a woman prays or prophesies, in other words, if she's part of the prophetic community, if the spirit a prophecy, the anointing of the Holy Ghost is upon her. And everybody in apostolic church gets the Holy Ghost. And everybody and everybody that's called Pentecostal don't get the Holy Ghost. In fact, some of the biggest Pentecostal denominations, less than 2% of their new converts are getting the Holy Ghost, and less than 50% of their entire congregations have the Holy Ghost. The ones that do are mostly the older people. But, I, but so, so be it, you know, so you can see the reflection of that, that it's, it's changing from a prophetic community into a non-prophetic community. And, and I've not got anything against them except that if you're part of the prophetic community, he said, look, if you're part of the prophetic community, everybody, men and women, are part of the prophetic community, but that does not change the fact that gender reflects the image of God, and that, therefore, if a woman has the prophetic anointing upon her by baptism of the Holy Ghost, then then her uncut hair is a sign of that, a symbol of that, the authority is in that, and a man cuts his hair. Now, don't argue with me. Don't argue with the Bible. And there's not a single person that's read 1 Corinthians 11 that doesn't know it doesn't say that. I don't care what scholars they are. They know it says it. But the only way to get out of it is to say, well, it was a cultural custom of the day for the Corinthians because of the present distress that they were in, and it was never intended to be a mandate for the church. 
And I would say to you that the first chapter of Corinthians tells us that he wrote that for saints that are everywhere. Saints that are everywhere. And if you're going to start picking and choosing what is cultural, then you choose that you're not going to follow the first half of 1 Corinthians 11. Okay, I'll choose the second half of 1 Corinthians 11, which the entire second half is about communion. So we're not going to have communion anymore because I decided it was just cultural. And so what else are we going to decide is just cultural? So how far do we go just deciding that everything's just cultural? Hey, I don't care if you decide it's cultural. I mean, if you're out there in the world and you decide that's the way it is, that's fine with me. But, I, but I'm going to give you a little example of what, why some people are saying that, that claim to be part of the prophetic community, if I could get there in just a minute. But I just want to point out to you that this is the whole idea of why throughout history, women have never wore slacks. Well, am I going to take slack for this or not? You put this on the Internet, it's going to be exciting. Now, let me repeat. Now, if you're not a part of the prophetic community, I don't care if you wear slacks. I mean, I start to say I don't care what you wear, but it does matter that you wear something, I suppose. I mean, I'm not judging. I'm, I, I'm, if you're not, you know, judging begins at the house of God. If you want to really get strict about it, the Bible wasn't even written for the whole world. It's written to the, especially the epistles, they're written to the prophetic community. And so, and so, so this anointing gave knowledge of what to do and how to do it. And it gave, in every case, it gave anointed utterance. Speaking in tongues is the first initial, it was both, it was also a sign. It was a sign with, it was a sign of the prophetic utterance when Saul got anointed Samuel said, they're going to know that you are anointed to be king because the spirit of prophecy is going to come on you. It was a sign. And, and it gave them ability. It gave them ability. All the artisans, the Bible talks about the spirit coming upon the guys that made the tabernacle and the people that wove the, the, the priest's clothing and so forth. It was the spirit that gave them those skills if we had time, we'd talk about every saint and the skill that God has given you. The anointing of God wants to use that particular skill and strength and for you to find ways to use that for the glory of God. And, um, and I want to pause here long enough to talk about intrinsic authority. It gives intrinsic authority. Not conferred authority as in winning a vote like a democracy. Not in conferred authority like a great corporation where a board hires and appoints the CEO, hires and fires. We are talking about an authority that is not humanly derived, originated, or conferred. We're talking about an authority that is out of the future, that is not responsible to in terms of being under the authority of the present. It, this is why Peter said, just answer me. Should I obey God or man? It is because his preaching was from a higher authority. And as a result of that, he had no reservations about that. And he did not worry about, he did not worry about, and this is where I'm crossing another little subject here, he did not worry about the vote of the people, uh, whether it was an actual tabulation or whether it was determining the vote of the people before he preached certain things or did certain things. He did whatever the Spirit anointed him to do. And he understood. Now, there are fears in regards to biblical leadership. There's fears. There's a fear to act. There's a fear of people. There's a fear of uh, rejection. Uh, there is a fear of loneliness. These are all elements that uh, are part of the struggles with biblical leadership in all of our lives, but there is a necessity to accept the responsibility and to act and to motivate others and to execute judgment. Now, I'm winding down. Is my time? Am I on? Or am I off? Where am I? I'm. 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 I'm I've just topped the mountain. I'm going down the other side now, and the downhill side's a little shorter than the uphill side. So, uh, I hope. 
Um, I hope the trail going down doesn't end up like this. But, uh, and I hope it's not so steep that we wreck the wagon by going down too fast. So hang on. Your scarf's going to be flying in the wind here the last little bit. But, um, but there is a, there is a tremendous hesitancy on the part of leadership to step into executing authentic, genuine, biblical, apostolic leadership. And to analyze uh, all of the reasons for that is beyond the scope of this study this morning. But to recognize that that is there is important. In fact, there's a tremendously deep fear on the part of people who have never been struck with a prophetic anointing and called to minister deep enough to overcome that inertia. And therefore, they never cross that bridge, and their fears keep building up like a wall, and they never become effective in ministry. And so they're embarrassed by that, and so if you have become effective, they are tempted to criticize you and say, well, it's because he's compromising, or well, it's because he's this, or well, it's because he's that, or well, it's because of that, or that. Uh, which is a mistake. What they ought to do is just say, the mountain's in front of me, and there's no way except for me to go through it just like these other people have. God, it's you and me, and I'm going, I'm going right now. Amen. So, uh, this passiveness, I don't want to re preach, teach a lot of things here, but this passiveness uh, was seen in Moses, in that Moses did not do one proactive thing from the time God called him to deliver uh, did not make one proactive decision on his own. From the time God called him to deliver the children of Israel uh, with his preaching to the time he got to Mount Sinai, he only did what he was told. Uh, now he was a, he's the greatest leader of all time outside of Jesus Christ in any secular dominion or religious dominion. There's no leader that went through all of the different domains of leadership that Moses did and did it successfully. Uh, and time doesn't permit us to, to, to validate that by teaching on it, but, but Moses was very reticent about this, and he gets the tables of stone, and he brings them down, and he sees the people dancing around the golden calf, and so him and God play what I call seven come eleven, and I'll, I'll show you what I mean, if you, if you, if you, uh, if you turn to Exodus 32, 7, here they are, the people are dancing around the calf. And this is God on the seven. That is verse seven. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go, get thee down for, what's the next word? Everybody say the, that word. For thy people, which, everybody say the next word. Thy people, which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. And Moses says, No, no, we're not playing seven. We're playing come 11. And verse 11 says, And Moses besought the Lord his God and said, Notice this now. Look at the language. Lord, why doth thy wrath wax hot against thy people? Thy, everybody said thy, thy, thy people, which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand. And so Moses and God are playing 7 come 11. And it is definitely a crapshoot. And so, what's really happening here is Moses is saying, God is saying, Moses, these are your people. Moses is, mm -mm -mm -mm. they're not my people. They're your people. God said, no, Moses, they're your people. He said, no, not my people. He said, Moses, you brought them out. <laughs> not me, I didn't bring them out. You brought them out. And God said, they're not my people, they're your people. And I didn't bring them out, you brought them out. No way, God. Mm -mm. They're your people and you brought them out. Nobody wants them. Because they are so goofy. And so, God has to make a decision. And God says, all right, if you won't embrace them as their leader, 
if you won't, embracing them includes executing judgment. Taking authority. If you won't embrace them as leader and all that that entails, then they don't have a leader and they're not a people and I'm killing them. And God says, Moses, stand back. They're not your people. They're not my people. You're my man, though, and I'll make a people out of you, which must have been a little temptation to Moses. But God was ready to kill him until 3232. And Moses says, Yet now if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book, which thou hast written. I want you to get this if you didn't get anything else. An apostolic leader has to feel and embrace oneness with those people and his responsibility to lead them to the point that their demise is his demise. To the point that he cannot say, well, I'm teaching it to them, and if they don't want to listen, you know, that's their problem. I'm going to play golf. He has to become one with those people where he has recklessly, if you please, gambled to the point that if they self-destruct, I go down with them. And you know what? It may take a while, but people will find out whether the leader's got that kind of commitment to it or not. Let me tell you one more thing. The next person that asks the question, how do you get people to be so loyal? You just got the answer. You don't get that kind of loyalty by you being some kind of aloof, distant figure that's never made the permanent commitment to them and their children and their grandchildren that says we're not moving off the prophetic community and all that that entails. We're standing right here. You can trust that I may go down, but it'll go down forward. We are not going to go down backwards running from the enemy. I don't care what generation is. I don't care how dark the night is. I'm telling you the prophetic community is not out of the night. It's out of the future. And nothing can destroy the indestructible prophetic community. Come on, we ought to clap our hands and praise Him again. <laughs> hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. You may be seated. And so, as I have said to this church 85,426 times, more or less, it's an approximate figure. Until Moses would take the Ten Commandments in his own hands, he couldn't lead. He couldn't just say, here's the Ten Commandments, follow them. All that was symbolized by taking them in his own hands as the leader that is connected inextricably both with the commandments and their God and with the people and their wanderings. And the moment he takes them in his hands and accepts the role of leadership, he breaks them. Because no man can take the perfect law of God and execute it with perfect judgment without breaking them. And there's a tension between the imperfection of humanity and the perfection of divine word that the people of God have to have enough elasticity to know and accept. But I will tell you, God will not let them be his people uh, and he will not let the man be the leader unless he takes it into his hands even though God knows that he is going to break it with his imperfection. Which is why we teach over and over and over in this church, don't fall into the hands of human government. Not the cops, not the judge, not the city council, not the preacher. Because they're going to make a mistake if they execute judgment more than three seconds. 
And all of you who think you can execute perfect judgment, you have the hubristic pride and arrogance that's endemic to the whole human carnal self that thinks they can do everything. But we are pathetic when it comes to executing judgment. All of us. That's why we need the divine power of God to help us. And that's why, listen closely, and that's why the whole New Testament is filled with this. Instead of trying to adjudicate every offense you've ever had, many of them that you are justified that you were done wrong, don't even, God is saying in essence, don't even try to adjudicate it. The only way to get through that, the only way to erase all that is just forgive. Because nobody can judge and work all that wormy stuff out that are human beings. Forgive, and it's already taken care of. And it releases you from it. Amen. So what about all of the, uh, what about all the preachers that say, uh, well, this is the, this is the latest fad among backsliding apostolic preachers. This is the latest fad. Are you ready for this? Well, I'm not going to be a policeman. That's the latest cop out. I'm not going to be a policeman. Do you know where the word policeman comes from? Some of you do. It comes from the old Greek word polis, P-O-L-I-S, which is what Plato spent most much of his life contemplating how a polis, which is the Greek word for city, state, community, how it should be operated. And the polis is the, is the place that the community lives. And the polis man, police man, is simply the man that's guardian over the polis. And if he won't guard it, then why do you have it? And polis men carry guns. Everybody, you know, everybody that opposes what I'm saying this morning will take little statements like that and extrapolate out of that how mean we are. We had some young people go to in and out after church Friday night a few months ago. A gang of football players there still in their uniforms, at least the pants. Some of them didn't even have a shirt on went in and terrorized the place, jumped on the hood of people's cars going through the drive through line, jumped from hood to hood, and a couple of our, a bunch of our young people were there and after church here. And um, they, so a couple of them went out, two or three of them went out to get in the, the pickup to leave, and these, some of these guys were leaning against the pickup. They said, we'd like to leave if you don't mind. And they said, if you touch one of us, we're going we're gonna to thump you. And so they got in the pickup, and they put it in reverse, and they were very careful. And one of them hit the side of the pickup with his fist or kicked it or something and said, you blank, you blank, you hit me. And so they opened the doors and proceeded to pummel um, the young men. Well, they were pummeling one of them, and the other one saw him coming and, in Jesus' name, pummeled back. But anyway... Um, and uh, <clears throat> my 11-year-old grandson was in the middle. He got out and ran and hid in the car wash. <laughs> and um, so our assistant youth leader, he there was three policemen in in and out, two or three, four. And um, the youth leader said to one of them, said, could you uh, escort me out to my car? And uh, he said, no, I'm not going out there. There's probably ten guns out there. I'm not going out there. Well, look what's happened to my children because, because nobody's, nobody's preaching it. Look what's happened to my children. Preacher, would you preach it? Not me. There's probably ten guns out there. I'm not. Not me. I'm not preaching it. 
And uh, so the assistant youth leader went out there, and then about ten of them jumped him and started beating on him. Then went to the hospital, and he's, he's okay. No worse than he was before, anyway. <laughs> Just kidding, Ryan. And, um, and um, so the police sat in there and watched all this. When they started beating on him, police cars all came and started all turn on their sirens and got on their horns and, and loudspeakers and said everybody dispersed. I'm, I'm for the police department, but that was cowardly. And uh, so I talked to the president of this and the president of that and went to the police department and talked to them. And somebody called the TV station. There's more than one way to get attention, and Brother Young was interviewed at the in and out with the in and out in the background. They come out and run him off the property, and so they interviewed him. And showed where they kicked in the pickup and so forth. And uh, so we, we tried to do what's right. We called the newspaper and said, look, we don't, we don't want this to get in the newspaper in a way that's going to destroy the whole respect that people have for government. So we're not asking you to, to, to run this. We're telling you, though, that here's a problem. So I talked to the police department, told them what their guy did, and they were halfway apologetic. And um, I said, not now... Uh, my assistant youth leader's brother, he, he comes out of the world, and his, his, he's, he's got cousins or some, some relatives that uh, his family is, is not in the church, and they have other kinds of connections. And uh, so some of those relatives said they're going to be over there this coming Friday night. And um, so the policeman, he, that's the first time he really showed emotion. He said, oh, no, 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 no. Tell him not to do it. I said, oh, no, it's too late. It's too late. They're coming. <laughs> said, his sister, youth pastor told him, don't come. He said, hey, bro, you don't tell me what to do. I'm coming. I said, they're going to be there. It's really going to be a deal, too. And uh, I said, you guys got yourself in a pickle because they didn't do their job. I said, no, I'm going to be there. I said, if you come over there, you're going to see me. I'm going to be sitting at a table with the biggest Bible I own right in the middle of in and out I'm going to sit there for two or three hours. And uh, so Pastor Young and Doug and I, we went over there, and we sat right in the middle of it. And he said, no, we're going to do something about it. And that Friday night, they, had, they checked every car that came in. They had police all over that place. Man, I mean, they were. Of course, it's after it's all over. So I'm not. Disparaging. I, I, I don't want to do that, but, you know, I'm just showing you that. And I know you can still see this, but you can't do this. <laughs> one of the, uh, they interviewed one of the policemen on TV. And uh, I didn't see it, but I did hear it. Yeah. <laughs> because I don't watch people. Right. <laughs> Well, Brother Wilson, I have a family, you know, and people may leave if I preach the truth and the tide would go down. How am I going to pay, you know, the pool payment, you know? So God has a 
metropolitan area. That's a big city. Metropolis. In fact, God has a cosmo, cosmopolis, cosmopolitan. Cosmo means world community. That's where you get the word politician, and you can see how far it's eroded. God forbid that it's going to happen to preachers too. His politician is the one that political is the polis manager, along with the polis man. But when people start taking advantage of it by not doing their job and not executing righteous judgment, then you get confusion. I was, uh, you know, Thomas Kraft is a friend of mine, and uh, he's been a mentor to a lot of younger men, and I'm not a young man, but Thomas Kraft was very, very influential in my life when, well, he's probably 15 years older than I am, and um, he's about 61, and... uh, Ah, uh, maybe a little more, but uh, <laughs> and uh, he would uh, a few years ago, several years ago, and you that know him, he he's just got a magnetic personality. He's you know he's anointed to God, but he part of his anointing is an incredible personality. Uh, he is just Mister Personality. You just can't help but like. If you don't like him, you just have to be a Nutcase. I mean, he, he's just he's just charismatic in the right sense of the word, and there's a lot of wrong senses. And uh, and and he uh, was preaching in England, and the missionary was sitting on a platform, and they were preaching. I don't know what town they were in, but he was preaching, and on the back row, a group of Teenager and young people, of maybe some of them were 20, 21, young men, six or eight of them came in, and they were all with their goofy hair and, you know, the whole bizarre deal. And um, when they turned to service Brother Kraft, he started preaching. They started disrupting the service. And so while Brother Kraft was preaching, finally it got too bad to continue, and the missionary was very nervous, and Brother Kraft said, you boys on the back row, be quiet while I'm preaching. You're, you're, in, a, you're in a place where you're supposed, to, you're supposed to be respectful. And uh, we're glad you're here. We're glad you're here. But, but you know, you're disrupting everybody else. That's not right. And uh, much more gracious than what I just did it. But it's, so they did it again. And, and again, he graciously, but a little, little edge said, um, you guys be quiet. I'm, I'm trying to preach. This is not right. And uh, this went on like four or five times until finally the magnetic, gracious Tommy Crap looked at them and said, I said, shut up. Don't another one of you open your mouth. You understand me? I mean what I'm saying. You are acting like, you are acting so out of order and unbecoming. You do what I tell you. And each time he did it, the missionary just couldn't believe he was doing it. And the missionary finally just like had his head down for the reason that he had his head down just to go up. And Brother Kraft was just taking him on. And, and they kept on. And so three or four more times it went on where he said, I said, shut up. You don't do this. And Brother Kraft is probably all of five foot four and 98 pounds. He said, I'm telling you, you don't do this when I'm preaching. You understand me? And eventually he, he backed them down. But none of them came to the altar. And several years later, after church on Sunday night in Jackson, Mississippi, where he pastors, a young man came up to him, nice suit, dressed, looked good, handsome. He said, hello, Pastor Kraft. He said, hello, do I know you? He said, 
Yes, but you don't remember me. He said, who are you? He said, you remember that night in England, that certain service you told people shut up? He said, yes, I remember. He said, well, I was the leader. And he said, I want to tell you something, Pastor Kraft. You're the first man I ever met that had the guts to stand up to me. My parents wouldn't. Nobody would. No authorities would. And he said, you stood there and told me to shut up and do what I'm supposed to do. And he said, I told myself, that man's got something I need. He said, I've been baptized in Jesus' name. I've got the Holy Ghost. I'm living for God. And I'm preparing for the ministry. Stand with me. This is no day. We're not talking about being ugly. We know the Bible says speaking the truth in love. But in a day when people are so mushy that they have no form, God give us people that understands what it means to be a part of the prophetic community. Let's lift our hands. Let's worship the Lord. Holy Ghost Radio. We are Acts 238 Salvation Message Compliant. Are you? That the Acts 238 message uh, is the basic message of Christianity. If you don't believe that, I want to be nice to you, but I want you to tell me why you don't believe it. We don't have to explain to you why we believe it. You've got to explain to us why you don't believe it. Uh, because that's the man with the team. Holy Ghost Radio. Have you received the Holy Ghost that ye believe? And I'm not just trying to hype you up, but I want to tell you, this is one message that's not going down. It doesn't matter if it's pre-modern, modern, or post-modern. This message is hot. It's cutting edge. It's on the level. It's always going to be powerful. You can never outlive its power. Visit our website at www.holyghostradio.com. And if you want to be relevant, then preach Acts 238. Because that's the message that's relevant to every generation.